All right, so I want to send a big welcome to all of my students. We are finally back, and this is going to be the first and actually only screencast that we will have for section 11.4. And if you notice, we're still in chapter 11. Um, you had just recently taken a summative assessment that dealt with genetics, and so the second summative assessment for chapter 11 is going to deal with a second form of cell division called meiosis. And this is going to be the type of cell division that is actually used to produce the gametes that are used in sexual reproduction. So before we actually get started talking about the process of meiosis, what we need to do is we need to talk a little bit about genes and a little bit of information on chromosomes, which we had touched on back in chapter 10. Now, when we talk about uh, meiosis, what we do is we refer to cells as either being diploid or a haploid. And what you see on the left-hand side here is an example of a diploid cell. Now, I want you to look at the prefix here, di. Now, remember, the prefix di is going to refer to 2. All right. So a diploid cell is going to have two sets of chromosomes. It's going to have one set of chromosomes that came from the mom, and that's what maternal means, and one set of chromosomes that came from the dad, and that's what paternal means. All right. Now sometimes when we refer to diploid cells, we refer to them in the two end state. We're going to talk about the two end state in just a second. Now we use a term or a set of terms called homologous chromosomes. Now this term's kind of familiar to you because we had talked about something called homozygous um, in our first summative assessment when we talked about genetics in chapter 11. And it means the same. When you look at this first part of the word, H-O-M-O, -O, it means same. So what we have here is, and if you look over on the left, we have a set of chromosomes that code for the same material. Now if you look here at this green one, we have two, of course, and we need to remember that we have one set that came from the mom and one set that came from the dad. And that's what we're talking about down here when we said maternal and paternal. So this is considered a diploid cell because it has both sets of chromosomes. It has the mom and the dad in the same cell. Now, if you look down here towards the bottom, sexual reproduction is going to create a diploid cell. Now, what that means basically is we have all the cells that make up our body, which are considered our body cells. We also use the term sometimes called somatic cells. Both of these words mean exactly the same thing. But during sexual reproduction, we have gametes. We have the sperm and we have the egg. So when those two gametes come together, they actually produce the diploid cell because we have a full set of chromosomes being represented. We have the set from the mom and we have the set from the dad coming together. As I had said, that was an example on the previous screen of a diploid cell. This is an example or an explanation of what it means to be a haploid cell. Now, if you remember before, we had the prefix di, and that meant two. Well, when you look at this prefix, which in essence really isn't a prefix, but it kind of indicates or implies that we have half. In this case, we're looking at the number of chromosomes that are going to be found in this cell. So we have chromosomes now that are not found in pairs. In fact, we only have half the required amount of chromosomes that are necessary for that cell. Now, the only way that you would actually see a situation where you actually have a cell that actually has only half the number of chromosomes would be either a sperm or an egg cell. Now, remember, these are going to be considered the gametes. So both of these types of cells all gametes are considered haploid. They only have half the chromosome number. Now meiosis, the process we're going to look at in just a second, is going to create this haploid condition. In other words, it's going to allow us to be able to produce the gametes. Now before we had said that when you look at the situation where a cell is considered diploid, and remember that all of our body cells are considered diploid, they have a full set of chromosomes, you would represent that with 2N. And when you look at haploid cells, like the sperm and the eggs, you represent them with the letter N. All right. So if you think about it this way, um, your gametes have half the number. So if we have an organism that, say for example, has gametes that only have 12 chromosomes, if we look at the body cells of that organism, which of course, as we said, are diploid, we would take the two, multiply that by 12, which again, the N represents the 12. So if we look at this over here, if we do the math, 12 times 2 is going to be 24. So every body cell in that organism is going to have a full set of chromosomes in the number of 24, right? So that's the difference between the N and the 2N. 
As I said, the process that actually allows us to get to that haploid number, in other words, cells that only have the half the amount of chromosomes, is actually a process called meiosis. And so if you look at the definition up here, it says meiosis is where the number of chromosomes in a cell is cut in half by separating the homologous chromosomes in a diploid cell. Now remember this prefix right here, it's going to mean the same. So when we're talking about chromosomes, we're talking about chromosome sets where we actually have one that came from the mom and one that came from the dad. So those chromosomes are considered homologous and these occur in a diploid cell. So if you look at number one, it says the daughter's cells will have half the number of chromosomes that are found in the parent cell. So in other words, you're going to go from a diploid state, having a full set of chromosomes, to a haploid state only having half the number of chromosomes. And so that's what you end up with right down here. All four of these cells only have half the amount of chromosomes at the end of meiosis. Now, if you notice it says, how is this done? So basically what you're going to have is you're going to have a situation where you're going to replicate the DNA just like you did in mitosis, and that you can see that represented right here, but you're actually going to have two sets of cell division. So kind of going up here towards the top, this is the original cell that we started with. And again, these are homologous chromosomes. One is red, one is blue. Well, they're doing that because they want you to understand that one came from the mom and one came from the dad. But if you look at this next cell, we actually have two copies of each of those cells. We actually have two copies of the mom's chromosome and we have two copies of the dad's chromosomes. So this is where the replication has occurred. Now if you look down here, we're going to have this cell that's going to divide. So in essence, you're going to take the mom and the dad chromosomes and you're going to separate them into two separate cells. All right. Now remember, we have two copies of that chromosome still, but we have separated the homologous chromosomes. In other words, we have separated the mom and the dad chromosome. Now, if you notice it says in number three, the first division is known as meiosis one, and that's what you see right here. Now, what's kind of interesting is we have a process called crossing over, which will occur during meiosis one. Now, if you notice and you look really closely right up here during this part of meiosis, you'll notice that the chromosomes um, or the chromatids from both the mom and the dad, they kind of crossed over each other. They kind of touched each other. Well, when they did that, they actually exchanged genetic material. So when you produce the two cells that you start off with for meiosis II right here, you're going to notice this red chromosome, which again came from the mom. Again, what we see here is we see one that actually has a little bit of blue at the tip of that chromatid. And this one over here on the right-hand side, this was the one that came from the dad. Again, it's replicated because it replicated up here in this second part of meiosis one. It actually has a little bit of a red tip right there. Now, that's where crossing over occurred, and its main purpose is to increase genetic variety in organisms. Now, as we said, the second division is known as meiosis II, and that's what you see right here. And this is the situation where you actually take the original diploid cell, so again, it's going to be diploid, or 2N, and you're going to reduce it to a haploid state. So at the beginning of meiosis II, it's actually haploid, all right? So it only has the N. Now, some people get a bit concerned or a little bit confused here because they don't understand because it still looks like it's diploid. But remember, diploid and haploid refers to homologous chromosomes. And we no longer have that because we separated the mom and the dad chromosome. So it says this is going to be where the reduction in chromosome number actually occurs. And so what you see here is we take the two copies of the mom chromosome. We're going to divide that again in half. And so that's going to produce these two um, cells at the very bottom. These are going to be gametes down here and the dad does exactly the same thing. We're going to separate those two chromosomes and produce two cells from that. So these are going to be considered the gametes that are produced from this meiosis process. So what we need to do next is we need to look at what specifically occurs during meiosis 1 and meiosis 2. Now remember meiosis itself is considered um, reduction division. So our goal at the end of meiosis is to produce four haploid cells. Now if you look at meiosis 1 you're going to notice that we actually start off with what we consider a normal body cell or a normal somatic cell. Now what that means is that we actually have a cell that is considered diploid. 
Now please remember diploid is going to refer to the 2N state, which means it has a full set of chromosomes. So you have a cell here that is beginning to go through cell division. And what we do in meiosis is we classify the two sets of division as meiosis 1 and meiosis 2. So what we're talking about on this screen is meiosis 1. Now you're going to notice the name of the different phases are exactly the same as what you had seen in chapter 10 with mitosis. So if you notice, we have prophase 1, and just like in mitosis, what we see here is we see a breaking down of the nuclear membrane, we get an appearance of the centrioles, and of course the chromosomes become visible. Now if you notice, it also says that crossing over will occur during prophase 1. Now over here on the right hand side, this kind of gives you an idea as to what's happening during crossing over. Now we had talked a little bit about crossing over as basically being a situation where you get a um, exchange of genetic material between the two homologous chromosomes. So if you look at this diagram over here to the right, you're going to notice we have a set of homologous chromosomes. Now they're different colors because remember they're homologous which means we have one from the mom and one from the dad but they got so close together that they formed something called a tetrad. And when they did that, they actually were able to switch um, pieces of chromosome or genetic material between them. And so what you end up with is you end up with what you see over here on the far right, where each chromosome has a little bit of the other. And so what this does is it helps to introduce genetic diversity. So again, what we have is the next stage, which is considered late prophase 1. So sometimes they'll look at the phases and they'll consider them either early or late. But overall, it's the same phase. And so during this time, if you notice, we have those centrioles with spindle fibers forming. Um, again, the nuclear membrane continues to break down. The tetrads have begun to form. So again, those homologous chromosomes have gotten very close together. Now, if you notice in metaphase 1, and again, you notice they're all diploid. In metaphase 1, just like they did in mitosis, they're going to line up along the center. Now, in anaphase, you're going to notice when they do separate, in mitosis, we had sister chromatids that would separate. But in this case, we're having the homologous chromosome separate. So what that means is this. We have, maybe this one was representing the mom, and this one was representing the dad chromosome. Remember, they were identical. They both coded for the same material because remember you have a copy from your mom and a copy from your dad and this represented the mom and this represented the dad. So what we're doing is we're pulling apart those homologous chromosomes. And then at the very end during telophase 1 and eventually cytokinesis, um, what we have here is we actually have a situation where now we're forming two brand new cells but each of them actually only has one set of chromosomes. So there's no longer a diploid state. We no longer have both the male and the female chromosomes being represented in the same cell. Now if you notice it does say it's diploid in telophase 1. Well that is the case because cytokinesis has not completed yet. All right, So that splitting of the cells has not completely occurred. But once we get to cytokinesis and we have two separate cells, then it actually becomes haploid, which means it only has one set, and that's what's going to take us into meiosis 2. Now, as we had said, there are actually two different stages of meiosis um, for this process. We have meiosis 1, and this is going to be meiosis 2. Now, we took the two cells that resulted from meiosis 1, and we're going to carry those over into the second set of cell division, which is going to be meiosis 2. Now, if you notice, we have the same phases being represented down here than we had had before. Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, then eventually cytokinesis. And the same thing is occurring, but instead of working with diploid cells, now we're working with haploid cells, because the cells that are produced at the end of meiosis 1 are considered haploid. They only have one set of chromosomes. Now, if you notice, during prophase 2, same thing occurs. We have a breakdown of the nuclear membrane. Centrioles are going to appear, and of course, the chromosomes are now visible. When you look at metaphase 2, these chromosomes are going to line up in the middle. But instead of homologous chromosomes lining up in the middle, now we actually have just single chromosomes lining up in the middle. And so in this case, during anaphase 2, we're going to have a separation of those sister chromatids. And so those are going to pull apart during anaphase 2. And then of course during telophase 2 is when we're going to get the development of that um, cell plate or um, cleavage furrow between the two cells. And again, remember these are haploid cells we're working with until eventually cytokinesis will go ahead and occur and we have four complete cells at the very end. So again, these are considered haploid 
daughter cells. Now remember, they're non-identical because we had crossing over that occurred during meiosis one. Now, once fertilization does occur, in other words, once the sperm and the egg actually come together, we're going to give that cell a new name, and it's going to be called a zygote. All right? And of course, a zygote is eventually going to develop and form the new organism. So this very last slide is just another way to look at comparing mitosis and meiosis. So everything that we've talked about up to this point, I want you to make sure that you understand it in regards to the things you see on the left-hand side. So first off, in mitosis, this is what happens during um, cell division of body cells. And remember, another word for body cells is going to be somatic cells. The only area where meiosis actually occurs is in the sex organs because those sex organs are going to be used to produce the sex cells or the gametes. Now remember, the gametes are the sperm and the egg. Now the purpose of mitosis is simply there to replace either worn out or damaged cells. Now the purpose of meiosis, of course, is to produce the sex cells, again, sperm and egg, for reproduction. When you look at mitosis, you start off with a full set of chromosomes. They're diploid, start off as 2N, and at the very end, when you produce your two daughter cells, it is still considered 2N. Now in meiosis, on the other hand, remember the purpose is to produce those gametes, which need only half the number of chromosomes, so we're going from a 2N situation to an N or haploid situation. In mitosis, the daughter cells at the very end are genetically identical. They're essentially clones of the parents. But in meiosis, they're actually a little bit different because remember that crossing over occurred during prophase one. Now, number of cells produced at the end of mitosis is going to be two, and the number of cells produced at the end of meiosis, remember we're producing the gametes, are going to be four distinct different gametes. All right, so that's going to finish up our very first screencast for um, this next summative assessment for Chapter 11. And remember, this is actually our only screencast for this particular section. So what I need you to do is I need you to make sure that you complete your screencast notes before you come to class.